how many people here are familiar with transfusion medicine and donor typing and blood group genomics? Oh, wow, there's actually quite a few. Amazing. <laughs> there's usually, like, nobody. Um, okay, so over the course of this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring everyone up to speed and say, why do we genotype um, for blood groups? Uh, what are the current problems? And then I guess what you all want to know is how does nanopore fit into this, into this space? Um, so basically, the basics of blood transfusion, it's a widely used clinical intervention. I'm sure you've all heard of it, and it's used to treat the symptoms of blood loss. Um, some individuals are transfusion dependent, and these are people who can't produce red blood cells. Uh, they have a genetic disease that causes them to produce faulty red blood cells. And the example here is sickle cell patients, and they receive transfusions. They can receive transfusions as often as every two weeks. Um, and to ensure the safety of a blood transfusion, uh, you must identify and match the blood groups of both donor and recipient to prevent aluminization. And just to highlight how serious that is, on the bottom here, I've put this um, blood tube. This is 10 mils of blood. So if you transfuse this and it's mismatched for ABO, it will kill somebody. Um, it causes this perfect storm in the blood. So that's how serious it is. Um, and so current blood typing is mainly done by serology. So immunohematologists will say it's not technically true, but most of it is done by serology. Um, and I think you're all quite familiar with this. Basically, what you do is you get some red cells, you get an antibody that's specific to an antigen. So I've tried to represent this with the blue dots here. If you um, mix them together and they agglutinate, then you're positive for that. And if they don't agglutinate, then they're negative for that. And this is kind of the very basics of how most serology, serological testing works. But there are some limitations. So reagents um, are not available for all of the blood groups. Uh, and what this has led to, or there's no high throughput testing method for some of the extended phenotyping. And what this has led to is about 85% of donors in any given blood service won't have um, typing data for their common blood groups. Uh, and 94% of donors won't have any rare typing at all whatsoever. And to kind of illustrate this, I've just pulled random 20 donors from some of the data that I work on. And these are some of the common antigens across the top. So this is what I would call full house common typing. And you can see where there's a red gap. There's just no result for these donors. So this is what the data looks like. Uh, people say it's kind of like Swiss cheese data. And this can lead to significant problems in the provision of blood and matched units for these difficult patients. Um, so what can we do about this? Well, in recent years, um, whoops, oh, sorry. So the blood banks are turning to DNA. So this circos plot over here, um, this represents around the edge are kind of like a representation of the protein sequences for all of the blood group genes in red. Um, so these are genes that encode blood group antigens, and in blue we have the platelet antigens. Uh, and the important circle is the innermost ring there. And these red lines represent coding variants uh, in those genes that encode blood group changes directly. Um, and what you can see here over on the uh, left-hand side, right-hand side, I guess, um, is some of the data from the early work in my PhD. So this represents about 90,000 comparisons between genotype predicted blood group and serologically defined blood group. And you can see that we're incredibly accurate. In fact, we only had 70 discrepancies in all of those. But you will see it's not perfect. Like, even in ABO, we have some discrepancies here. And like I said before, these kind of discrepancies will kill somebody. So they're very, very serious. So error, the error rate is not to very tolerable at all. Um, and I guess what I'm going to talk to you now is about how I've used nanopore to kind of come in and feel like, you know, understand these discrepancies and not necessarily completely resolve them in the other technologies, but at least be able to detect them. And then I just won't type that particular antigen because that's the safest possible way of doing this. Um, so how do we predict a human blood group from genetics? So basically, there's an organization called ISBT, and they maintain a link between phenotype and genotype. They have these huge tables full of genetic variants, and then they say this combination of genetic variants equals this blood group. And so I've illustrated that using um, ABO. So you've all heard of the ABO blood group. I'm, I'm sure you've all heard of this. Um, and so up here at the top, um, on this, this, these three red bars represent sort of uh, the proteins that encode an A blood group, blood group A, and the yellow represents blood group B, and then in the bottom we have blood group O. And I've just put on the coding positions, which actually encode the difference between A and B. So it's seven SNPs. Uh, and so what you can see is that in B, these SNPs are different to A, and then that's how you get a difference between the blood group. And O is actually most commonly in Europeans. You'll see this 261 del G, so deletion very early on in the gene that leads to truncation of the protein. So you just don't produce A or B, so you're O. Um, 
And what I've done is I've kind of, you know, put this into an algorithm. So basically what I do is I look for the ovarians first in a sample. And then I say, OK, do you have two ovarians? Um, and then their phase. There's a bit more to this than just this algorithm, but there's a bit of phasing going on. And then I say, OK, so you've got two ovarians. They've come in uh, trans, and then your O. And if you have one change, then we see if you have the B nucleotide changes. And if you do, we predict that your blood group B, because most commonly, uh, o variants come with blood group A. So in this case, you'll knock out the A, and you'll be B overall. Uh, and if you don't have the B changes, then you're A. And this is really important, and so on for zero copies. Um, and so that's really important. So keep that in mind, because I'll show you what happens. So what we did is, I said before we had these errors in ABO. So we referred them to nanopore sequencing. So we did um, uh, PCR-free whole genome on the promethion. We just used one flow cell per sample. Uh, and we get about 15x whole genome coverage. Um, and what we did is uh, we sequenced some of these discrepancies. And what happened is it revealed a crossover of group O variants into the B background. So I said before that the algorithm kind of says, like, OK, if you're B, then the O will go with the A, and it will knock out the A. Well, this is not the case for these guys. So there's been a rare sort of crossover event of this allele. And this was revealed by Nanopore. Initially, we thought there'd be structural variants. But really, it was just this crossover that we hadn't observed before. And so we hadn't accounted for it in, in the blood type. Um, yeah, and I've just used this slide to highlight it, that this is, now, this is where the, the algorithm was tripping up for those ABO discrepancies. Uh, and we've actually used the nanopore haplotypes to write an algorithm that now, when you see this in other types of data, so sequencing data or array data, it can actually detect when this is likely to be occurring. And then it doesn't issue a type for these individuals. And it says, you know, you definitely need to confirm them serologically and like, you know, pull them in or use another method. Um, so this is my first example of the use of nanopore, and this is where it kind of came into the project. And then I kind of needed, so I think nanopore is a fantastic tool for getting haplotype for the blood group gene. Um, and I wanted to highlight this with a case study. Um, so this is an RH null case study, and I'll explain this in a bit. But we have a patient from Leuven. Um, she was recruited, uh, sorry, so she has a bleeding disorder, uh, and it's von Willebrand's factor related. And um, they were recruited to the NIHR Rare Disease Project. This is a project that sequenced many, many rare disease individuals using the Illumina platform. Um, and she requires regular transfusions. And um, she has RH null serology. So this won't mean anything to you who are not transfusion nerds like me. Uh, but it means that she lacks all of the rhesus system antigens. So rhesus, the positive negative, is just one of them. There's actually two more that are very common, and many more after that. Um, and just to give you a, a, a uh, like a feeling of why this is so interesting. Her blood is ultra rare. Um, so it's a phenotype discovered in 1961 in a woman of Aboriginal ancestry. And actually, there's only been 43 people globally ever identified with this blood group uh, between then and 2017. So it was extremely important to explain the phenotype and like why she has this phenotype. Um, and it proved to be very, very difficult to resolve. So the sample was sent to the global blood group reference laboratories that do a lot of molecular typing. And here I've just put a report on one of these, um, just to show you an example of one. And they detected this RAG variant. So RAG is the rhesus, pro uh, so the rhesus group is two proteins that come together to form a pore, and RAG pins them into the cell membrane. So without RAG, then you can't pin in your rhesus, and you don't have the antigens there. And so they detected this splice site variant that kind of like disrupts RAG function, but only heterozygously, so it doesn't explain her phenotype. She had one functioning copy of the gene. Um, and my professor kind of brought this to me and said, you know, you're not passing your viva unless you solve this case. <laughs> I <laughs> turned around and put it, and so I referred it to Nanopore because I've had some success at resolving complex cases there before. Um, and like I, I've, uh, we confirmed this splice site variant first of all, so I was like, thank God, like you know, I can at least detect that with my software. Um, and then we also identified uh, a, about a 2,000 base pair tandem duplication in RAG. And the beautiful thing about the nanopore was we were able to phase it as well, so it wasn't in cis, it was in trans. Uh, and we used Sniffles and WhatsApp um, to do that, and then we confirmed it with Sanger sequencing. So we actually confirmed this person's blood group and resolved like why she has this incredibly rare blood. And you know, this, I said before, the ISB team maintained the link between serology and genotype, but they've never seen this before. So now we can get a whole sequence for this gene and submit it to them and say, you know, we think it knocks out. And we can request red cells from them and confirm the serology, and then we've linked it. So it's quite a nice 
it's demonstration how this technology can improve our knowledge about these incredibly like rare events and stuff and really have like a big impact in a field such as transfusion medicine. Um, so moving the project. So I just I wanted to give you some examples and just say like how we're using it. Uh, and then moving forwards, what we're going to do. So I mentioned the NIHR Rare Disease Project earlier. So we have these 13,000 patients, and they've all been sequenced as part of sort of the initial phases of Genomics England and put into that. Uh, sorry, 100,000 Genomes Project. Uh, and um, they all have 30x whole genome short read sequencing available. And we've already been using Nanopore as part of this cohort to resolve. So we resolved a, uh, a Glanzman's case where there was an inversion, and actually inside the inversion, a duplication uh, in <laughs> exon 9. And this will go into the, uh, there's a nature paper that's in review at the moment, so it should be coming out shortly. Um, but because we had some success, again, we thought we'd invest in the technology and kind of try and take it forward. So we're going to use about, we've got about 100 unresolved cases. So these are cases where they've had 30x whole genome sequencing on short reads, uh, and we still don't have a diagnosis for them. But there is some signal in the short reads of sort of genomic recombination in the clinically relevant genes. Uh, and these are all going to be put on a promethine, and they're going to have 15x whole genome sequencing by nanopore. Uh, and then we'll combine the data sets and try and solve the clinical cases. Um, not only are we just going to use this to solve clinical cases, because obviously that's, that's quite a lot to just solve that. So we're, the data can be combined, and like obviously when we sequence a patient, they've got blood group genes. So I'm going to take all their blood group genes out and produce really nice haplotype reference maps for this. Um, so just in conclusion, um, Nanopore sequencing is excellent for resolving complex genomic cases, and we've definitely been using it to do that. Um, High-quality haplotype reference sequences, um, they're going to completely redefine our knowledge. Like, um, if you speak to anyone in transfusion medicine, there's a whole bunch of structural variation we know that encodes blood groups in systems that you might not have heard of, such as MNS. And we can, complete, we can use Nanopore to completely redefine our knowledge of where these genes are recombining and stuff like this. And this will... Um, all this data can be fed into algorithms for genomic analysis and make them much, in the case of blood type, are much safer. So when we use other technologies, we can come, we can find where these kind of samples, because we know what's happening with an, in the by using nanopore reads, we can write models and say, okay, look, this is just how the signal changes in arrays or short read technology when you have this. So it's definitely a really amazing technology and definitely has a big part to play in the future of like you know clinical applications. Um, so I'll just wrap up there. I work in a huge team, um, and particularly I want to acknowledge Alba, who works on the Nanopore project with me. She's fantastic and way more knowledgeable about Nanopore than me. So uh, thanks all for listening. Thank you.